We are so thrilled that there's so many of you here tonight, giving up your evening and being home and coming here and hearing about the bridge project. So we're really grateful for you to be here and um, hear about the project and what the plans are over the next few years for the project. Uh, my name is Jennifer Zorn and I'm leading the public outreach uh, for the next few years on the job. My role is to assist the Vermont Agency of Transportation with what they uh, have planned for this project. It's a real pleasure to be here and to be working on this job because I can see by the people here that the bridge is very important to all of you. It's a great bridge. Um, we've had a lot of interest from uh, members of the public so far. We've seen, received a fair number of comments through the website. So uh, we hope that continues because all of your input really helps us, keeps us on track, and makes uh, certain that we as a project team can deliver the best bridge for you in the next few years that you get to enjoy for a very long time. So just a couple items. So I just want to introduce the project team. So from the Vermont Agency of Transportation, we have Bob Kleinfelter, and then also from Vermont Agency of Transportation, Carolyn Coda, and then also Mike LaCroix. And then from HNTB, uh, we're the consulting engineering firm, again, just assisting VTrans in this project. Uh, Josh Oland is our lead designer. Jennifer Zorn, as I said, I'm working on public outreach. And then also I will introduce Steve Spear too. He's here as our, as uh, assisting all of us. So we're here later to answer any questions that you may have. So a couple of housekeeping items. Out in the front before the, you come into the room, we have some promotional materials grocery bag with the bridge logo and notebooks and pens and we want you to take that home. I think we have enough for just about everyone because we want you to go home and think about the bridge. We hope you enjoy that. We also have a sign up sheet for email blasts. You can unsubscribe at any time. We will not give you too many emails, we promise. But these email blasts will just give you up to date up, um, updates on when we're going to have other meetings or community events or important milestones in the project. And the only reason we will use your email is to send you that e blast, nothing else. And again, you can unsubscribe at any time. You can sign in on the website using the QR code and leave comments on the form at the bottom of the homepage, or you can also sign in directly on the website as well. But hard copy also out there. And lastly, we are going to get through the presentation first. We have about 30 slides. We're going to go quickly through it. Um, it'll take no more than 30 minutes. And then we would like to open this up to question and answers. We have uh, a lot of people online, I hope. Can you see how many people call? We have 40 people online, which is great. So what we'll do is anyone here who has a question, we'll take one from the audience here, and then we'll take a question or a comment from someone online. And we'll just go back and forth, and hopefully we can get through that. Yes? So we would prefer to wait to the end. Just be, so th the other reason is that we do have some, in, we have four tables in the back for interpretation. So we're going to do a small chunk of information through the slides and then we're gonna do a quick pause so then the interpreters can speak in, we have Nepali, Arabic, um, Swahili and Somali, which I'm so happy to see everyone here. Um, and, the, and the interpreter, so thank you so much. They're from the um, African Americans Living in Vermont organization. So just to try to get through the slide, because we do have to pause a little bit for the interpretation to take place. So we would prefer to wait to the end. Unless there's something extremely overwhelming, then of course we'll, we'll, take, we'll take questions during it. Yes, Carolyn. I'm not sure if there is a question, we can go back to that slide. Uh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. We want this to be really conversational. We're so happy. We, f we feel like we're part of the community tonight. We want this to be a conversation. Uh, we want great dialogue. We want to really hear what you think. It's going to help us. Like I 
said, help us as a project team deliver the best bridge possible because it's going to be your bridge for a long time. So we do want to hear everything that you have to say and we'll do our best to address all of the comments and questions tonight. So with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Josh Olin, my coworker, and then I'll do a few slides just on what we're doing for public outreach and then pass it back to Josh. But no more than 30 minutes, we promise. Thank you. All right, so sound check as well. Everybody can hear me okay? All right, we'll jump right into this thing. So tonight's agenda shouldn't be too much of a surprise. Really what we want to do is give you a project overview. We want to talk a little bit about the contracting mechanism we're going to use on this project, which is unique. I promise it'll be a high-level discussion, not to bore anybody. We'll get back into public involvement, talk a little bit about the delivery of the project, the timing, the cost, things like that, and then open it up for Q&A. As we work through this presentation tonight, I want you to remember three things. The first one, the first most important thing is we want your input. We know this project will be impactful. We know this project will be something that's going to be in place for the next 75 to 100 years. We want to hear your input. The second thing is there will be more meetings. This is just the first meeting we're having on this project. We will be back to talk about many other aspects in much finer detail. So if we don't have an answer tonight, we hope to come back and provide you with that answer. The final thing is that the project is evolving. We are still in the very early stages of this project. We have an idea of what we want to do, but we want your input to make sure we understand how to progress it. So let's start off with that project overview. Uh, I'm sure most people are aware of where the bridge is located, uh, situated right between Northeast Burlington and downtown Winooski over the Winooski River. You can see it's situated just off to the west of I-89 as well, just for a frame of reference of where that is. If we take a slightly closer look here, we can see the bridge over the Winooski River right in the middle. We can really see that that project, that bridge is surrounded by a lot of buildings. We got a couple different mill buildings we can see on the screen. Another mill building off to the bottom right. Numerous residential and commercial properties and a dam connecting essentially right into the west of the bridge itself. However, there's a lot of things on that picture. So to kind of get our arms around it a little bit better, wanted to highlight what we see as the project area. It's really what you see here on screen. It's the bridge itself, as well as that intersection down in Burlington, that triangular intersection with multiple signals, which we'll talk about. To the north of the bridge, we don't really get into Winooski too much. It's gonna be a little blending of the roadway to match back in with what's there, but we don't go much further than the bridge itself. And I kind of mentioned that's the overall project area. Really, there's two focal points out there. We have the bridge itself, which we can talk a little bit about, and then we have the intersection to the south of it. You can't really do one of these projects without the other. There's a lot of interweaving aspects to make the overall project successful. They do have their own needs, which we're gonna talk about separately, but we're gonna be putting it all back together as one project. So before we start talking about where we're going with the bridge and where we're going with the intersection, it's important to look at what's out there today. Why are we doing this? So just a quick, quick snapshot of the existing condition of the bridge. We can see that the bridge was built in 1928, so it was reconstructed after the 1927 flood. It's been in place for just about 95 years now. So it's been out there for a long time. You can see from some of the pictures here, the bridge has some deterioration. There's some pack rust on the girders. There's some deck delaminations. We can see some efflorescence coming through from the bridge deck itself. The structure is non-redundant. It's got some pin and hanger systems out there. And the overall width at the top is a little bit substandard as well, which is something to be addressed. For the intersection, uh, for anybody who's driven through it, it's a bit of a complex intersection. 
There's multiple stopping points, multiple crossings. The crosswalks actually come up and kind of go around the entire thing. So a lot of different conflict points. So there's a lot of confusion here, and there's a history of crashes and queuing. So these two areas, the bridge and the intersection, these have both been studied in the past. They went through a scoping phase, is what we call it. Something that looked at a lot of different alternatives and came out with a report that made a recommendation on what to do with the project. So there's three separate reports. There was a bridge scoping report, an intersection scoping report, and finally a grant application for the bridge itself to support the funding. So I'm going to walk through those really quickly, again, to understand where we are going with this project. The first one is that bridge scoping report. This scoping report, at the end of the day, recommended a bridge replacement. It looked at a number of other solutions, but at the end of the day, it recommended bridge replacement as the appropriate solution to move forward. In doing so, it had a heavy focus on bike and pedestrian accommodations. The other thing it did dig into a little bit was conceptual construction methods. It doesn't dictate how the bridge is supposed to be built, but it talks about options and how it influences traffic and duration on site, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Part of the outcome of that study was to recommend the overall bridge width. So I've got an image here of the existing bridge in the top right and the proposed bridge beneath it. And you can see the existing bridge is about 57 feet wide total, out to out. The new recommended bridge is about 78 feet out to out. It's gonna have the same four lane pattern, but it's gonna have much, much wider accommodations and barrier separated accommodations for bicyclists and pedestrians. The next part is the intersection itself. So again, this went through its own scoping phase. They looked at the intersection essentially in a vacuum of what could be improved, what are the issues, what needs to be addressed, and they came out recommending a four-way intersection. So right now there's three separate traffic signals out there with Mill Street, Barrett Street, Riverside, Colchester. They recommended combining all those into one intersection to improve movements and reduce the number of conflict points, the number of crossings of pedestrians and cars. Again, a big focus of the study was on bicycle and pedestrian accommodations. So I mentioned the, the recommendation here was to come out the other end with a four-way four -way intersection. The proposal that's been put forward is to take Riverside, which is along the, right -hand, uh, the left hand side of the screen, and essentially turn it in to be, create a four-way stop across from Barrett Street. This reduces the number of signals increases mobility and increases safety. Again, a lot of this focus or a lot of the study was focused on bicyclists and pedestrian movements. So once those scoping reports were complete, the next focus was how do we move forward with funding? And so the next part of this was all about trying to get federal money trying to get additional federal money to make this happen smoother. So a grant application was put in in 2022. It was successful. The project now has federal grant money tied to it. And in getting that additional money, the report obligated to improve safety, address the bikes and pedestrians accommodations, as I've mentioned several times, um, complement the natural and cultural environment in doing so. We're not just gonna put back some cookie cutter bridge that doesn't fit in with the surroundings and really provide an appealing bridge, something that people are gonna be proud to drive over, proud to walk over, whatever it might be. And I've mentioned a couple times that the bridge and the intersection have really been looked at separately to date. Our job here going forward is to put those two pieces together, make them blend and act as one holistic project. So, so far to date, we've completed the concept plans. It's enough to allow our environmental groups to start looking into what's out there and understand the footprint of what our project is going to be. But it's just a concept. It's not the final solution, and again, that's why we are here today. We do need to combine those recommendations of the intersection and the bridge, but luckily for us, a lot of those recommendations focused on the same types of improvements. So I've talked a little bit about the existing bridge, where we're going, what it's gonna look like a little bit, 
like I said, a lot of that definition, we still need some input from you folks. The next question is how are we gonna get there? What's traffic gonna look like? What's construction gonna look like? So I wanna talk a little bit about maintenance of traffic and I'll, I'll say right up front, we are still digging into this. The things I'm gonna to present tonight are concepts and they're not necessarily final. But I do wanna get it out here and start talking about this. There are roughly 25,000 vehicles that cross this bridge on a daily basis, which is on par with, say, half of I-89. There's also around 300 pedestrians a day, somewhere between three and 500, depending on the season and so forth. It's a very, very busy bridge. And then for anybody who's crossed it, you know that already. As we start to dig into how to control traffic during construction, we need to consider not only minimizing impacts to the traveling public, but we also need to think about the construction workers out there trying to build this project. We need to make sure they have enough space to build the project and that they're safe in doing so. Really, in order to make that successful, we're looking at a combination of temporary lane closures and a temporary bridge closure in order to get the bridge back in place. So we don't take this lightly. We are starting to dig into what types of volumes are out there for the adjacent crossings to understand what can we use to move cars and other things around. This is that same map we looked at earlier. You can still see that project location highlighted in yellow. You can see there's five crossings of the Winooski River in this area, our project being the one a little bit off to the left. Further to the left, we have the burlington Colchester crossing. We've got I-89 in the middle, which we all know doesn't accept bikes or pedestrians. Lime Kiln Road crossing, and then further to the east is the Essex Williston crossing. We're also trying to figure out where people are coming from and going to utilizing this bridge. Right, that's pretty important. If we're going to detour people and we have to move them to other crossings, we need to know where they're coming from and where they're going to. This is just a snapshot of one time of the day. What's shown up there in blue is people's origin. That's where they're starting from for their daily commute, perhaps and the green shaded area is where they're going to. So you can see that's the general trend of people who cross this particular bridge. About 51% start off right here in downtown Minooski, and about 67% end up over in downtown Burlington. Again, just a snapshot in time of a certain peak hour, but these are the types of trends that we're looking at to understand where people are coming from and going to. Can we wait for questions to the end? Sure. Okay. Okay. We can come back to it then. So looking at the different crossings, looking at the origins, looking at the destinations, and what the closest crossing is, the most obvious detour for traffic if we're gonna close a bridge or reduce travel lanes would be to use I-89 itself. It'd be to take those people in downtown Winooski, move them east, take I-89 to the south, and come back around into Burlington. This detour we're showing is a closed-ended loop it doesn't fit necessarily with that origin destination map I was showing, but that would be if you were to try to get from one end of the bridge all the way back around to the other. It's the shortest vehicular detour that's available. We're not saying it's the right one, but it is the shortest. Of course, as we do this and talk through it, we're not just looking at that route up there in green. We're not just looking at those intersections. We're looking at all the spillover traffic that's gonna move into all the adjacent intersections and what's happening there as well. The most important thing I want to point out here is bold down there. I mentioned I-89 doesn't accept pedestrians or bicyclists. So the most important thing is, even if we end up with a bridge closure here, we are maintaining pedestrians on site. There will be a crossing on site for this project at all times. So how do we do that? How do we close the bridge but still maintain pedestrians? So this image that I have up here on the right is a sequential image of how the bridge could be constructed not necessarily, not necessarily saying it will be done this way, but it's an option. So if you're standing in Winooski looking back towards Burlington, you're gonna have the existing bridge somewhat in front of you. Off to the right of that, we're gonna build a portion of the bridge, wide enough to accommodate pedestrians and bicyclists, about 12 feet wide with barriers on each side. Once that's built and in place, we can move people over and we can move utilities over to that part of the structure. Once that's accomplished, we can work upstream of the existing bridge and build the rest of that bridge. And then during a short-term closure of roughly four to six weeks of detouring traffic, we can demolish the bridge, 
slide the new one into place and actually put the two pieces together. So pedestrians would be maintained on site at all times. Vehicular traffic would have to detour for roughly four to six weeks during that closure period and we're trying to hone in on what that exact time frame might be. So I mentioned maintenance of traffic, it's not something we're taking lightly. We're still digging into it. We don't have all the answers and implications. But we really are trying to understand how things operate. You can see a nice color-coded map there. Again, just a snapshot in time of what's good, what's bad. Red's bad, green's good. We do need to have further coordination with emergency services. We know closing a bridge to vehicular traffic is considerably impactful. We want to find ways to improve that type of impact. Same thing with transit. We know people use the bus system. We know they got to get across the bridge. And we know if there's added congestion, there's going to be delays in getting to where you want to go. Those are future coordination items. And we are currently trying to set up meetings with those agencies to have a better dialogue. I already mentioned we're going to be looking at off-site improvements. And the last part we're going to be looking at, too, is something we call user costs. What is the underlying cost to the public of us closing that bridge, too? And how do we weigh that against the construction cost? So that's a quick overview of the project in terms of what we think is going back, the implications of traffic, and what we're thinking about for different closures and maintaining pedestrians. I want to talk real high level about design-build contracting. And as I said earlier, I promise I'm not going to get into the weeds on this. It's enough to really help you guys understand what we're going to be doing here on the project. So what is design-build? Well, it's it's a way to put the final design of a project under the same umbrella as the contractor. So that way the contractor and the engineer can work together to find a method that best meets that contractor's abilities. Right? If we design something and a contractor has to cost it out and it costs way too much for a specific contractor, they could work with an engineering team to make it better. It really tries to shed a lot of the responsibilities and risks from the state onto the contractor for them to determine the best way forward. In general, marching right down the list here, it promotes innovations. It improves design and construction efficiencies because they can work together and actually design something directly for the contractor as opposed to trying to address it for multiple. Reduces construction costs and reduces schedule as well because again, they're working hand in hand as opposed to finishing the design then doing construction. So in a typical process, VTrans would be responsible for this laundry list on the left, and the contractor would be responsible for constructing it. Typical flow would be to define the project, coordinate the permits, final design, get into contracting, and then construction. Using the design-build method, it strips a lot of the responsibilities of VTrans and pushes them over to the contractor and lets us actually get this bridge project moving a little bit quicker. Get, groundbreaking sooner and so forth. So what does this mean for everybody? Why am I telling you this? I mentioned we're going to be back to get additional input. Right? We want to make sure this bridge feels nice. We want to make sure that you have different treatment options. We want to talk about specifics of what it's going to look and feel like. But in order to allow the contractor that innovation and to reduce costs, reduce schedule, they have to have their own flair of the project. So we need to be able to provide them with guidelines and not absolute specifics. So as we come back and talk about maybe it's railings, maybe it's lighting, maybe it's landscaping, we can get ideas, but we're not going to drill down to absolute specifics. And that's the reason why I wanted to bring this type of method up with you today. So the next part here is all about public outreach. So I'm going to bring Jennifer back up to talk about different ways to get involved. Great, thank you, Josh. So quick housekeeping, uh, Josh and I have stopped pausing because it doesn't appear that there's any interpretation happening. So am I want to make sure that we're, go, we're, we're understanding that we can just keep talking and not be pausing. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so as you can tell from everybody here and the many people online, Cole, how many people online do we have now? 45, 45 that's great. So, the bridge is really important. 
The public outreach process is really important, and the Agency of Transportation knows that. This is a really important project for so many people in this region. So they have made the public outreach component of this job a real priority. So we're doing a variety of things to reach as many people as we can, different avenues, whether it's technology, interpretation, translation, events, surveys, et cetera. That's just a few. Uh, because we do want as many voices and as many opinions involved and it's a great way for people to meet their neighbors and I'm sure there are people here that you haven't seen in a while and we want these meetings to be enjoyable and like, like a community event in themselves. That's the best kind of meeting. This is all about being transparent and open. We are reaching out to uh, all of the groups that you could think of. Um, working with um, the African American, excuse me, African Americans living in Vermont, the um, Vermont Language Justice Project to make sure that our primary materials that are really important for everyone to understand are put into different languages. Oops, sorry about that. So just a quick overview of why the public out, uh, public outreach process is so important and how it's going to help us as the project team. So we do have a project advisory committee. It's 10 members of the community who represent different organizations and right now we're meeting with them about once a month. We're reviewing what we're doing for the public outreach and they're giving us feedback, helping us improve if we're missing something, helping us overcome some barriers if we're having any communication barriers. So we're very grateful to these 10 folks. I'm sure some of them are here this evening, so I did see a few faces. Um, public meetings, this is just the first one. We plan to have many public meetings, each one with a different topic. So if you can come to all of them, that would be great, but we'll try to advertise what the topic will be so you know if it's something that would be of most interest to you. But we'd love to see the same faces all the time and even more faces. Uh, community events. We attended the farmer's market in Burlington and Winooski recently and had an amazing time. Josh, I think, had very detailed conversations with about 125 people who were very interested in the bridge and had a lot of questions. So that was really a good time. Door-to-door uh, -door outreach, especially to neighborhoods where English is not the first language. We have been fo so fortunate to engage with ALLV to uh, provide youth at being involved in this project. We have youth in the community, they speak two languages, three languages, sometimes even four languages, and Samuel, who is in the back of the room, has helped us um, arrange that, as well as Elaney Churchill from the Regional Planning Commission, and we're so grateful. Some of you got the postcard in the mail? Yes? Good, <laughs> thank you. I'm so happy you did that. Um, project website, and um, as I said, also translation and interpretation. So what does this do? This helps keep us on, on track. The more engaged all of you are, the input that you can uh, give to us, we will use all the input. We take it very seriously. Um, you're gonna also help us identify impacts that maybe we aren't sure of or we um, don't know the severity of them. And you're gonna help us uh, from that input to avoid or minimize the impacts. Um, and there's another way that you can help too. Is there any but history buffs in the audience here? Knowing that the bridge is an element of the historic district in the area. So if anyone wants to be involved in what's called being a consulting party, it's a Transportation Act is called being a, um, it's called Section 106, if you ever heard of that. Let me know if you want to be involved in that and I'll connect you with the right people. But that's another opportunity if you're interested in the history of the bridge and how it is an element of the historic district. So a couple things. We do have a website, although as I said, we are reaching out to people in the old fashioned way as well by using the mail. Um, on the website, we're trying to put all of the important project documents. That's going to unfold and build over time. We have software built into the website for these languages here. So if there's anyone in the room that this is one of these languages is your primary language, go to the website. You'll see the icon at the top, and there'll be very accurate translation of the material. 
okay? Um, really going to be a clearinghouse for information as the project moves on. We also have another software program integrated in the website. I'm just going to call it Pima for short. It's going to help us know who we are reaching, and it's going to help us um, check ourselves. Where do we need to do outreach further, in what communities, and who we're hearing from? And also, this program, Pima, um, is where if you, get a, if you submit a comment through the website, it's going to come to me, and you'll be put into the database, and we'll get, make sure that we get back to you very quickly on any of the comments or questions that you have. And that way we have a complete record of everything that happens over the next year or two. So ways to stay informed, you're all here. Thank you again. This is really amazing that um, you took time out of, your, out of your evening to come here. Uh, for those of you that came in a little bit late, on the website, please sign up for email blasts. We won't do too many. You can unsubscribe at any time. And also, you're free to sign up on the paper outside. Just put down your name and email. And the only way, only thing that that will be used for is just for these project updates, nothing else. We are going to attend events and also um, just submit comments to us. Give us good ideas and we'll get back to you and you'll help us, like I said, you're going to help us move the project forward and stay on track. So there is a great event coming up that the Agency of Transportation is supporting. I, don't, I haven't seen Bruce Wilson. Is he here? So Bruce runs Art So Wonderful. And Bruce and Art So Wonderful are going to have an event this Saturday from 10 to 6 on the Winooski side of the bridge. Some of you may be familiar with the mural. So Art So Wonderful is going to have artists there and they're going to be touching up the mural, but they want the community members to really lead that. There will be refreshments. Um, somebody from the project team will be there to answer questions and to meet everyone. So we hope that you can attend. Um, we think it's gonna be a fun time. And so the mural will be touched up because the bridge will not be, the construction won't start for a few years, so we wanted to make it look nice until uh, the new bridge comes about. And then Bruce has a plan to put a new mural up on the new bridge. So, all right, with that, I'll pass it off to Josh. All right. So to kind of round things out here, we've talked about what the projects are going to be, how we might get there, ways to stay involved. I wanted to talk just a high level about the timeline. I mentioned we're early in the project, and, and we really are. So it's a long timeline we see up here on screen for anybody who can see it in the audience. Overall, for the next couple of years, we're going to be trying to get our arms around what this project should be and could be with your support. That's going to last us sometime into the middle of 24. From that point on, we've got to get through all of our environmental permitting, our right-of-way negotiations, and actually find the space and ability to build this project. Sometime in the middle of 26, maybe early 26, we're going to be putting out what's called a, a request for proposals for contractors to actually bid on this project to build it. From that point on, they have a little bit of extra time to finish design before they break ground, probably sometime in 27. Overall construction will probably last about two full years, followed by a little bit of site restoration and cleanup around the area as well. So that's really a long time. We're talking almost about six or seven years from where we are now till everything looks completely back to normal. Groundbreaking, again, won't be for about three to four years, though. And then in terms of overall project cost, I did mention much earlier on that there is a raise grant tied to this project. So there was some success in getting some additional money, just shy of 25 million, and that really ties us into a timeline. We're obligated to have that proposal out by the middle of 26 in order for a contractor to bid onto it. So this project has money, it is moving forward, and it has a schedule surrounding it that's gonna force it to move forward. The overall project cost from a conceptual standpoint, which would include construction, design, right of way, everything involved is somewhere between 50 and 60 million for that bridge and that intersection. And with that, we're going to open it up for questions and I think we are going to, oh, yep. Um, if you don't mind, sir, here, you just repeat the questions or 
Yep, absolutely. And I think, Jennifer, were you going to take this around? And because I'm, I'm tied, so. So you don't have to take the microphone, but if you wanted to, I will walk. And I thought we would just go front to back. If anybody has a question here. Um, my name is Felipe. I live on Hickok Street. Um, I have kind of a lot of questions, but uh, the last slide was really concerning. Um, how can we as a, a city, uh, as a group of individuals, help speed the product, project along? Like, how can we compress that timeline, if at all possible? That's nuts to me. Yeah, so, so many projects take two to four years to actually get from initial conceptualization into uh, out to contracting. So it's not uncommon. This isn't anything completely unusual. That's fine, but regardless of that. Yep. It really is just a lot of effort getting into coordinating what's the right project and then sequentially working through getting your permits in place, your right of way in place, and getting out to, to bid. So we are actively running a lot of these things in parallel to try to be able to beat the clock and get out even faster. This is kind of the ultimate deadline. So I mentioned there's an obligation with the grant. We're tied to a June 30th, 2026 date. If we don't have a contract out, we lose the money. So we are actively advancing as fast as possible to beat the schedule. This is kind of a worst case schedule at the moment. And then the question I really wanted to ask was, um, what defines the scope of the because you mentioned that it's divided into these two things, the bridge and then the intersection, which I think is actually way more interesting because that's where all the action is happening. Um, how can we extend the boundaries of that intersection project, actually? Because a large part of the backup that occurs on the bridge uh, comes from people trying to make that left turn onto the street where Domino's is to go towards the airport. Um, and I feel like it would, that, that bypass would benefit from some intervention. Yep, so you're, you're asking, if I'm, if I'm understanding right, how to perhaps extend some of this project. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So we are, we are trying to keep this project at a minimum, right? I mean, if we keep adding more and more to the project, it's going to take even longer to get out. So we are trying to make something impactful happen within this type of boundary. And yes, they were defined and scoped separately, and we are currently working to stitch those together. But you should have heard a lot of similar trends with a focus on bike pet accommodations, improved safety, improved mobility, things like that. They had a lot of common features and a lot of common goals, and we're making those now work together as we move forward. As it relates to Barrett Street, um, the current concept, it might be a little hard to see up here. I, I encourage you to take a look at the easel too. We are putting a left turn lane in there and that's where it's going to be signalized as well. Some of those graphics that you see, again, very conceptual, not engineered yet. We have not figured out what those turn pockets or cue bays need to be. Do we want to take a question from online if there is one? Great, so, so for those, do I need to repeat that? Yeah, will the bridge projects overlap with the Main Street rebuild? So the bridge project construction will not overlap with the Minuski Main Street bridge, uh, Main Street project. Thank you. Yep. Hey, anybody over here? Question? And we'll go this row next. There you go. Hi, so um, I'm Cindy Cook. My question, I think, is for VTrans. Um, I think everybody in this room has been over that bridge. It's a scary experience. And you just showed us some fairly stunning photos. Um, I always take a moment of to have a moment of gratitude when I cross the bridge safely now. Uh, the prospect of seven more years with that bridge is kind of concerning. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, are you, do your engineers say that it has seven more years of safe life left in it? Well, seven to the, to the completion of the construction. Thank you. Yep, so I, I, I can answer that, and if you guys want to jump in, by all means. So, so the bridge is safe. It still has the full load carrying capacity from when it was first designed. So it's completely safe to continue crossing. The bridge is inspected every two years to check for further deterioration and make a determination if something has changed. 
but it's currently safe and there's no reason to believe it won't last another seven years until it needs to be replaced. Yep. Yep, I think Carolyn wants to chime in. Great. Thank you, Carolyn. So anyone out in the hallway, Stephen, can you just mention to people that there are seats up here if anybody wants to come inside? Okay, anybody else over in this row? And then we're going to go right here, and then we'll get to this row. Okay, we'll go around. And then we got to get somebody online. I forgot about that. You want to wait? Do you want to go online first? <laughs> Thank you. I'm Jonathan Chapel Sokol. You've mentioned that the um, that there was a strong focus on cyclists and pedestrians. Could you just talk a little bit more about what the current thinking is on the pedestrian paths and the cycling paths on the on the um, on the bridge? Because it looked to me like they were shared. Um, and would they be shared on both sides? Is there anything to protect pedestrians? There's a bike track that comes off on Riverside. When it would make sense to make that to continue as a bike path, but could the other side possibly just be for pedestrians? And I'm gonna ask, unless you're definitely opposed to this, that everybody talking to the microphone because it's very hard for the people in the back to hear, so thank you. Great, so, so the question was about bikes and pedestrian safety on the bridge and the shared use paths that we're showing out there as well and how it all interacts. And it's, it is a question we've heard a little bit about from different folks in the community. So yes, the, the image I'm showing down here in the bottom right, in fact, is what we call a shared use path for both bikes and pedestrians. It's 12 feet wide, so it's considerably wider than anything that's out there today, and in, including the Riverside path that's out there as well. We are looking into different safety measures to improve safety and keep separation between bikes and pedestrians. I know the, you know, the, the lake fronts walkway down in Burlington, they've got a, essentially a dashed line down the middle like a roadway. That's an option for us to help try to keep people on each side. There's other solutions like that. But frankly, that's one of the biggest challenges of merging the intersection and the bridge together is figuring out how to get people from either the road on a bike to a shared use path or from a sidewalk to that shared use path and make sure everybody's safe. So that is a huge focal point and something we are going to look into more. And then online here.
I guess may, maybe I'm not familiar with the term continuous sidewalks. Um, Oh, you're talking about a okay. So a raised sidewalk, so essentially like a, like a speed hump almost. Um, we have not looked into those. It's something we can talk about as a project team and look into. So we have not started looking at parking for anybody in particular on this project as we've started to put these two pieces together. So we can look to see what space is available for specific bike accommodations. Yep, and that's so, so the question was about lane width and increasing speed. So the existing lanes out there today are 10 and a half feet wide. We're only making them 11 feet wide to come up to current standards, so six inches more. It's not gonna be a huge increase, nothing too noticeable, and in fact, one of the big differences is we are going to be including separation barriers between the traffic and the bikes and peds. Having that will actually naturally act as a calming feature to slow people down. When you drive against something right up against your car, you will naturally slow down. So yes, the lanes are getting wider, but we, not, we don't think it's going to increase speed. Okay, questions here? Yep. There you go. My name's Michael, I'm a resident in Winooski. Um, if you can stay on that slide, actually. Just to confirm, it looks like there's a curb that rises to protect either the pedestrian or the bike lanes. Is that, am I seeing that correctly? I could come up and point to it. Yeah. Yes. 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 So is that a sort of guaranteed feature of this bridge? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I think I'd ask a similar question that I asked earlier, which is how many of you have biked across this bridge? You know. It's something that I do often with my three-year-old daughter on the front of my bike. Safety is a concern. I think we know from studies that separating a bike lane from a, or a car travel lane increases bike usage significantly. Um, that, to me, seems like the bare minimum of what we should be talking about. I think galvanized railings or fencing is something that the bike community would love, arguably the pedestrian community as well. Um, I, d I don't know if this has been discussed. No, we haven't talked about the treatment between vehicles and pedestrians yet. This one is going to be there for separation. We haven't talked about the height, the handrails, and the like So that's that. a guarantee. There will be barrier separation between bikers? That's what we're moving forward with. Okay. Is there I mean, that's terrific. That's what we need as a community. Um, similarly, I'm curious, uh, I don't know where it's in relation to this slide, but you brought up sort of contractor based decision making on the end use of the bridge, end functionality of the bridge. I'm curious if this divided uh, lane could come up uh, in this capacity, meaning if the contractor doesn't think they can do it or do it profitably, if the contractor ends up steering that sort of decision making. Thank you. So, so the question was more around, we talked about the, giving the contractor a little bit more control on the project to help keep cost and schedule down to a minimum. There are going to be, I, I have the word guidelines up there for lack of a better term. We're basically going to be telling the contractor the boundaries in which they need to operate. So a barrier, guaranteed. Can I tell you today that it's going to be specifically one and a half feet wide versus one foot three or two feet wide? No, that might be up to the contractor. Or if we all come together and try to figure out some sort of pattern or appearance of that concrete railing, maybe the contractor wants to change that appearance. The functionality and the safety is not something we compromise on. It's the final touches of what it's going to look like a little bit and how they get to that final product, if that helps. So we definitely encourage it. So the, so the question was about the likelihood of this contractor being a Vermont-based contractor. 
it's definitely something we, we encourage. I know we're going to be reaching out to uh, what's called AGC, the um, Association of General Contractors, I believe. We're going to be reaching out to that in Vermont to really make them aware of this project and try to get them, in, encourage them to go after this. This is a very large project, um, so it's not a guarantee it'll be a Vermont-based contractor, but there's certainly gonna be opportunities to subcontract with the primary as well. It, and, and maybe I, I went through that too quickly. It's not necessarily the hands of chance that we're doing this with. There are very strict guidelines and contractual language that if that contractor, regardless of being in Vermont or not, they still have to follow the exact same requirements contractually. And if it doesn't meet the contract, they will have to remove it at their own cost and replace it. So there will be very strict guidelines surrounding safety and functionality, things we talk about for improvements. It's just, again, how they go about constructing it, still within our specifications to meet material requirements and quality, but just how they go about putting it together. Did you have something to add, Carolyn, or? I usually don't need a mic. And if people know me, they know that. Um, so we have used um, design-build contracting on several projects um, in, the, in the state of Vermont where we've had a c consultant and a contractor um, do these projects. And they're usually, the consultant will, does all that design work, working with the contractor to build that. And usually, it doesn't matter whether it's an out-of-state contractor or in-state in -state contractor, they do what, what they're expected to based on those guidelines and all that kind of stuff. And we've had a lot of success with design build. The Richmond Checkered House Bridge Project was a design build project where we widened the truss. Um, we had several down on 91 and Brattleboro, the, the bridge in Milton that was design build on the interstate. So we've done a lot of this. This isn't something new. We just haven't done one for a while. <laughs> it's been a few years since we've actually put out a design build project. I think the scope of those Which is true, but the Richmond Checker House Bridge Project, that was a historic truss. That's the one that you see off the interstate where it was 20 feet wide, and we widened it for so that bicyclists and pedestrians could eventually use Route 2. So that was um, very similar. That bridge didn't contain a separated bicycle. No, it did not. So, but so we're Right, but in this particular instance, this if we say that we need that separation, that is what's gonna happen here. It's just like um, Josh said, whether it's concrete, railing, you know, that's t some of the stuff, one of the things that, you know, he did mention, this is a historic bridge, so he mentioned the term, or you mentioned the term 106, so we have to meet certain guidelines from a historic perspective as well with this structure, so there may be some things that we have to do to, um, kind of keep that historic integrity of the whole area. Is there going to be a lane for horses and buggies? No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Carolyn. Are we on you now? Are we on an online one? I've lost track. So, so the question was about a double-decker bridge or building one off to the east and essentially leaving it there is what I gather. We have not looked into a double-decker bridge. Those would be very costly and uh, probably obstructive to the views coming down the hillside. So we have not looked into that. Um, looking off to the east is something we are starting to consider a little bit. We are looking into the feasibility. I mentioned a lot of those constraints on site, a lot of mill buildings, a lot of residences. It's not real easy to do. So we are looking into it, but we're not in any sort of shape to actually say if it's feasible. Okay, okay. any other questions here? You'll be next, I'm gonna go with you. There you go. Hi, uh, my name's Tom, and 
I'm wondering, have you considered uh, the use of e-bikes and scooters? Because in that shared lane that uh, normally uh, gas-powered vehicles will be in, you're going to have people walking and people with uh, kids and carriages and e-bikes going, you know, 28 miles an hour and scooters and right now it's a complete mess on, on like the Burlington Bikeway along the lake. Um, <clears throat> it's, you know, it's a free-for-all. And are you going to separate motorized uh, non-automotive vehicles from pedestrians and human-powered bicycles? Uh, so it's a great question about uh, consideration of e-bikes and, and similar devices, one wheels, scooters, whatever it might be. Uh, coincidentally, that came up through our online platform. I know Jennifer mentioned we can take comments through the website. That same concern has come up recently, and it hasn't been something we've really considered to date. So it is something we're going to start focusing in on more. Um, you know, the, the original bridge that's out there today, for anybody who don't, doesn't know, was built for trolleys. You know, they never anticipated having four lanes of traffic out there. It was meant to carry trolleys. So things change over time and we adapt and we make what's out there work. Um, we're at a point where we can consider a little bit more for the future and try to plan for those and we're starting to look into it. Fal a quick follow up. My personal experience has been I've been walked on that, the bikeway up parallel to Riverside. Yep. And come within inches of people who have been back to my hands. Okay. And I, had, I could not hear them and if I had just wobbled a little to my left, Yep, completely understood that speed can be a huge factor out there. Um, not that it makes it 100% any better, but I do know the shared use paths we're talking about will be a little bit wider, but it's still something we are going to look into for safety. Okay, we'll go back to the audience. And don't worry, people in the back, we are making our way there quickly. Hi, my name's Tom. Uh, you mentioned that the bridge will be there for 100 years, and I'm wondering how much consideration is going to be given to the aesthetics of the bridge? Are there any preliminary ideas on what kind of style it will be? And what's going to give it that kind of nice look that will make it fit into the character of Winooski and our little downtown? Is there going to be, is there budget constraints around that? or? When does that happen in the process? Thank you. So the question was all about aesthetics on the bridge and budgetary considerations and how it's going to look and feel. Uh, frankly, that's part of what we're going to come back to you folks on. So we're going to be coming back at some other future date to talk more about aesthetics. I know Carolyn was mentioning a little bit about historics. There are going to be some things that we might have to satisfy permitting requirements in terms of the look and feel. But to the extent practical, we're going to be actually coming back to you folks to figure out what you want it to look like. So we have a pretty good sense that it's going to be a bridge that looks similar to what's out there in terms of kind of just the nuts and bolts. But it, then when we start talking about rails and lights, and I know at the farmer's market we had people suggest putting little bump outs and benches on the bridge or lighting. or There's a lot of different ideas that have been put forth that we can start talking about. We don't know where that's going to take us yet. Do you want to take one online? Uh, this question comes from Liz, and she's concerned um, about the detour traffic, specifically negative impacts that could potentially be had to the Roosevelt Park and IAA neighborhood that people were to be coming off of 127 at Park Street. Um, and so she was just wondering if there is any commitment um, from the city to route 127 traffic to Pearl Street if that has been decided at this point. Yeah, the, the the whole traffic detour is still something we're looking into. Uh, again, we're, we're not taking traffic detours lightly, and we know there's a lot of traffic out there as well. So we are going to be looking into the different locations and neighborhood crossings to see if off-site improvements are necessary. That could be simple signing all the way to actual temporary pavement type of improvements. We're not sure what those look like yet. Okay, anybody else in this row? Yes, sir. Here you go. 
Hi, my name is Bob, and I have two quick questions. One is, did you look at putting a circle in on the Burlington side uh, to slow down traffic and get people, and get rid of all the waste associated with waiting for lights and for people zooming down Colchester Avenue trying to make a green light and zipping across the bridge? And the second question is, the original bridge in, in, in 1927 was taken out by, by a, a rain event. We just had a rain event. What is the capacity for rain uh, and the stream to, underneath this bridge? Are you guaranteeing for the next 100 years that we're going to be OK and not have it wash out? Thank you. All right, excellent. So, so kind of two separate questions there. The first one was about the intersection just south of the bridge and if a roundabout was looked at there. And that was part of the scoping study. Uh, geometrically, it, it essentially does not fit. There's not enough room there between the historic buildings that border Colchester and that's nestled in between Colchester and Riverside and then the river itself. So trying to physically get a roundabout in there just really doesn't work without incredible costs. Yes, I think I can. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, so there's one rate, I'm going to do my best here, one rate in the corner here of Riverside and Colchester. The couple here along Colchester and Maine. And then as you start getting further back from the bridge, I'm less aware, but I know there are a number and they're all well documented in these reports. So if you want to flip open these reports, they're on the website and they fully document all the historic structures in Burlington and Winooski. Uh, for the second question about the hydraulic capacity. So yes, you're right that the 1927 bridge got wiped out by a flood and apparently they even blew up the mill building at the corner to make hydraulic capacity work during that event, which is kind of interesting to me. That bridge was substantially lower in elevation than this current one. So for anybody who was out there at the bridge during the recent rain events, you saw there was plenty of room between the girders and the river. The parking lots themselves got a little bit of water in them, but the bridge was unaffected. We would be going back with a similar roadway elevation and similar low point on the bridge, so we shouldn't have any sort of significant hydraulic implications. Beyond that, the river itself, if you've seen it with the dam water drawn down, it's all ledge, it's all rock. It's not erodible. So our, better, our foundations would be founded right on that as well. Can you say that last part again? Yeah. Um, since the bike and uh, pedestrian access is going to potentially be built prior to the full bridge, would it be possible to further separate these uh, bike lanes from the car traffic by uh, 10, 20, or even greater than the Got it. So part of this process, uh, the, the little piece that's going to be built downstream that I've mentioned is going to be hugged up right against the dam. That is a physical obstruction that's not going away and not something we can influence. So we are constrained by that dam location from being able to build further downstream. Um, beyond that, we're not looking to increase any sort of additional separation, provide additional bridge width for further separation either. Okay. Anybody else down this row? This way, yes sir. Hi, uh, my name's Ben. Uh, I just wanted to come back to the concern raised about the safety of pedestrians and cyclists on like multi-use paths. Um, I'm wondering about like raised cycle paths specifically or vice versa, like raised uh, sidewalks for pedestrians. And if that is a, you know, a feature that, that VTrans could say like, this is non-negotiable or is that something that falls under the design build, like it's up to the contractor. So the question about using a raised sidewalk in addition with kind of the bike lanes that are out there, it's something we can consider. Uh, but if you're going to be taking essentially two barriers and putting bikes and pedestrians in between it, putting something raised out there would essentially create a tripping or a 
kind of a fall hazard. So we'd have to think carefully about how we'd go about working through a solution like that, just how we have to work through some other safety considerations as well. Um, but again, with, with the design build piece to it, if there's anything we decide that is necessary for the bridge related to safety and functionality, we will tell the contractor what to do. It's just when it comes to other subtle features. So if, if we thought that a raised sidewalk was the most safe and prudent solution, we would tell the contractor to do that. So but we can look more into it. Oh, okay. Uh, this, isn't, this isn't much of a question, it's more just a concern. Um, Martin, who walks the bridge four times a day, works in one of the mill buildings directly adjacent, and he just wanted to um, let the project team know that there have been many near misses in his experience walking along the bridge with vehicular traffic, and he just wanted to know that he was concerned that the new design cyclists will be sharing a lane with pedestrians. Okay. So it sounds like a similar comment that we've received here tonight about pedestrians and bicyclists using a shared use path together. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else here? Okay. Have you ladies? Okay. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nick. I live in Burlington. I cross this bridge about four days a week, uh, usually on a bike. Um, I'm concerned about two things. One, overall concern is that this bridge design, which is essentially just a 20% larger version of the existing one, locks into place a land use pattern that is inconsistent with the potential that this area has. This is the two densest and some of the largest communities in the entire state. This is the most direct path between them, and we're just continuing to re-optimize it for the car traffic and when we have an opportunity to imagine much more. And I really think, I'm kind of disappointed that, at what I'm seeing here. More specifically, uh, I'd like to reiterate what I've heard from a lot of other people about the shared use paths on either side, which literally marginalize cyclists and pedestrians, but not just cyclists and pedestrians, literally everyone else who's not in a car or a bus or a truck. Um, that includes people on mobility scooters, um, on electric scooters, e-bikes, which we all know cause a lot of concern. I sh you know, I'm usually con crossing this bridge and getting around town using a bike, but I share the concerns of folks like Tom who uh, don't want to share space with, with me and me going, you know, at a, like 15, 20 miles per hour faster than him. Um, that's not fair to them, and I just see that this bridge is reinforcing that kind of design at uh, a time when we really need to be increasing the dignity and the appeal of modes that are not getting around in a car. Nope, I appreciate that comment. Something we can definitely take back with us and look into further. So, yeah, Laura. Laura. I'd run over. Hi, I'm Laura Wheelock with the City of Burlington Public Works. I'm one of the um, municipal members helping advise on this committee. I do want to point out. One thing that the municipalities feel strongly about is as these barriers go back on the bridge, we're looking for the most flexibility. So while this is the lane configuration we need today, as our modes do shift, we might have the opportunity to move those barriers and reallocate the space on the bridge to the other mode types. And so we are looking for that flexibility in our 100-year bridge. Do you have another online question? Or? My name is Peter, I live in Winooski, and I, uh, I ride the, the, across that bridge every day on a bicycle. I'm wondering if you could uh, tell us a little bit more about the way uh, bikes would get from the traffic circle onto the bridge. Right now, the traffic circle has no real place for bicyclists, and then you have to go down a short street and then hit the uh, sidewalk. It's, it's, it's really a mess, it's, as many people have said. But I, I, I'm wondering how, whether there will be uh, bike lanes on the, um, real bike lanes on the traffic circle that will lead to whatever kind of pedestrian bike path you have. Thank you. Uh, 
Excellent. So the question was about transitioning the bike lanes from the bridge to blend into whatever's in Winooski in terms of sidewalk infrastructure that's there today. That, that is something that we're focusing on. We haven't come up with a perfect solution yet. Again, we're kind of very early and just trying to come to people to understand what's critical before we start putting pencil to paper. So we know that's an area that we really need to look at to make sure everybody's safe for that transition. And it's something we will go back and look at further. So my plan is to stay with the rhythm and work my way to the back of the room for the people who have been sitting and waiting. And then if there's still more questions, I know you and you, sir, then we'll start from the front again. Okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you. Hi, my name is Chuck. I walk across the bridge back and forth every day. And I like the, the idea of a double-decker was interesting. Structurally, it lo looked like it'd be impossible to, due to load-bearing. Load but what if you reserved the lower level for traffic, cars, automobiles, trucks, buses? You have an upper deck for pedestrians, and you can separate out bicyclists. Their ingress and egress to the upper deck is a lot more simple than would, it would be for cars. And that way, you could have three lanes e either way on the lower deck. In other words, put your upper deck for pedestrian and bicycles. There'd be less low bearing, less structure involved, and, you, and the ingress and egress would be more simple. Yeah, so so the, the question was about using a double-decker system for both vehicles and pedestrians and perhaps separating them vertically versus horizontally. Um, we've talked a lot about, there's, there's quite a few constraints out here, the dam, the buildings, the historic structures, uh, everything about it. Frankly, going back with the double-decker system here is going to be very, very complex and would have significant right-of-way implications. It would have a profound change to the overall area. So I, I'm not positive a double-decker system is going to be something that's feasible within the area without massive disruptions. But which we can still consider looking at separation, though. Yep, so the, so the question is about the impact to GMT during a closure and what happens to the transit routes and congestion. That's something we haven't started coordinating with GMT on to really understand what that type of issue looks like. It is something we are going to be actively engaging with them on directly, though, to understand what that means and how we can mitigate. Sure. Um, I'm with GMT. And I'm on the GMT board, and the sooner that you start talking to GMT, the better. Right now, uh, our labor pool is impacted, and so freeing up new uh, b buses to haul all people around is, um, if you said you needed to do it next year, it's just no way it would happen. Okay, I'm going to pick up where I left off, which is down here. There we go. Let's get you next. Uh, Joel Collada, Vermont State Walking College. I'm coming to echo some thoughts earlier uh, about pedestrian dignity in particular. Um, even with, and bicycle dignity, I, I personally bike commute, but I've learned to really advocate for walking as a mode of transportation lately. Um, with that current layout, the concrete divider or whatever we settle on certainly would provide some physical protection. But man, still like walking next to a truck going 25, if they're, if they're, if they're obeying the speed limit, a truck, a bus, a car, motorcycle going 25 miles an hour, I, 
we, when my girlfriend and I walk to dinner, we have to cut off all conversation for the length of the bridge. Uh, it feels like I'm treated uh, pretty, pretty lowly. Um, so I'm really looking uh, to see if there's any way to, uh, we, we had brought up the double-decker bridge and completely separate pedestrian paths. Uh, I've seen in some places where there's like a marsupial bridge. It's not a full-on uh, double-decker. Um, and, and I'm kind of thinking of the Winooski side where we already have a river walk and potentially maybe there could be like a little pedestrian branch that goes in this direction down to the river walk. Um, I'm really just looking for things for dignities. Uh, so uh, given my statement, if there's any questions you can extract from that and if you want to answer, that would be great. You gonna answer that, Josh? <laughs> so, so the question was that uh, really, really, if I understood correctly, that feeling of walking next to cars zipping by and really feeling a bit uneasy about it. So the question was kind of surrounding what else can we do? And uh, I believe what you're referring to with the marsupial type of bridge is actually getting the sidewalk kind of tucked under a little bit. Yep. So the Winooski side naturally opens that door, right? There's a path underneath the bridge over there. You could do something like that. Um, the Burlington side, we haven't gone down that discussion path in terms of figuring out if we can do something similar. And then we'd have to look at types of headroom and safety of putting a pathway down there as well. The nice thing about having the paths at the bridge deck level is everything is very visible. If you start tucking it down underneath, you need all sorts of different lighting and you have different safety precautions as well to consider. So it does have a different mixed feeling depending on who you ask but something we can talk about as a team. Thank you for your patience. Hi, my name is Lucia, and I um, am wondering a little bit more about the funding. I understood that there is an about $25 million federal grant and then I thought I heard that the total project would be about 50 to 60 million, and I'm wondering where the rest of that funding comes from. I should have worn my sneakers. <laughs> yep, no, great question, and, and I glazed over that during the presentation, but this upper, this upper chart here, if, if it's legible from back there, um, the project funding is a split of 80% federal, 10% state, and then 5% for each of the cities themselves. So it will be made up from that, that pool. So will they impact taxpayers? The project? Yes. Okay, we'll finish this with this row. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, I just want to echo a lot of the comments I've heard tonight. Particularly, I, I want to echo the comments uh, about what seems to me that this project is really just a 100-year dedication to accommodating more car traffic. Um, I think you know we have to, basically, as a society, if we want to address a 1,000 different issues, uh, shift mode towards bus, bike, and transit, um, and walking, excuse me. Um, and I was reading through the report, and, and I'm a little bit confused because looking at the alternatives, my favorite was Alternative 1, which was pretty inexpensive compared to this. Uh, it would have a much lower uh, impact on taxpayers, it seems. Um, and all it did was basically add a separate bridge for bikes and pedestrians. So you get to keep the sidewalks on the existing bridge, you get a separate path for bicycles, and you do a few cosmetic, uh, you know, it's not not it's not negligible funds but it's not 50 million dollars either um, and that preserves the bridge in good condition for at least 50 years that's what the consultant said um, and that's a healthy state for at least 50 more years above its current lifespan so we already know it's not going to expire for another seven years they're not worried about that that's another 50 years on top of that that's almost i don't know i don't know where that gets us but that's part of the way towards a hundred year bridge which is what we're talking about so i don't really understand why <laughs> Basically, what we're, we're not even talking about that. We're talking about doing a whole other thing that I understand what you're saying, but basically this is going to induce more traffic into downtown Winooski, into downtown Burlington, into places where people live. We can't walk across the street and have a conversation with our partners because there's so much traffic, there's so much noise. Um, it's not sitting well with me, and I don't understand why we're here 
instead of still talking about the other alternatives. So if you want to answer some of those questions, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, so, so the question surrounded why aren't we going back and looking at the other alternatives a little bit closer. We are moving forward with a bridge replacement project that's part of the federal money that was tied to this. We can look at ways to improve safety in bicyclists in doing so, uh, but we're not going back and looking at doing additional rehabilitation to the existing one. I do want to stress though, I, I know Laura kind of touched on this, I kind of touched on it a little bit as well, that existing bridge that's out there was never meant for four lanes of traffic. It was never meant for the amount of pedestrian traffic either necessarily. It did morph over time to accommodate what we have today. And when we look at that cross section that was up on the screen with the different lanes, we are looking for mobility and how we can make that a flexible system going forward with different modes of transportation. So we're not locked into this forever. As our modes of transportation change, that bridge can be adapted to meet those as well. Okay, I'm gonna still work my way to the back of the room and then we'll start at the beginning again. So I just wanna get the rhythm. Yes, anyone right here? Um, hi, uh, my name is Carlos and I usually ride my bike around. That's like my favorite mode of transportation. Um, I appreciate like all the focus that you're putting on pedestrian and cycling infrastructure. I think that's very important. Um, again, this is not really a question, it's more like a comment, I guess, or input. Um, and yeah, it's just like basically really bad to just go in on Riverside Avenue on your bike and then the multi-use path ends and you're in a very narrow sidewalk. You have to like um, basically compete your way with pedestrians, whereas the cars have, I think it's 60 feet of, of, um, of like, you know, of way right now, whereas we have less than 10 feet for pedestrians and cyclists. There's also, I don't remember seeing like any numbers for people that cycling on that bridge. And like all of these, like we can change this from that design. Um, there are also different alternatives that we can use such as um, on like b bus only lanes. I think there are like that, that's an alternative that I would like to see for example, like to put it on one side of the lane, like on the, um, I guess the farthest one on the left will be or on the right. And that will like reduce traffic and like we know that buses can carry way more people than like a, um, like a regular car link and, and the same goes for pedestrian for a for a multi use path. Like like we know um I also wanted to I mean you guys are designing this, you probably know how induced demand work, like that's not something that I should be explaining here right now. Um yeah, that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Carlos. You. Excellent. So, so the question was, if, if I if I kind of captured the the comments correctly, it was about the interface between Riverside and the sidewalks and the widths and trying to make sure we're balancing the needs for everybody out there. Um, yes, we're putting back four lanes on the bridge. They're only getting six inches wider each. That six foot sidewalk is doubling in width to 12 feet to try to improve that accommodation. The blending from the bridge onto Riverside is something we are going to further study. We know that that transition from the bridge to the approaches is something that's critical for safety. So that is something that's gonna be looked at a lot more so. And then, oh, and then the other question or comment you had was about a dedicated bus lane. So uh, again, um, right now our focus is actually getting the bridge itself built with the four lanes. Additional studies or long-term future changes could reuse one of those lanes for a bus only lane versus the four striped lanes. Okay, next row. Hi, uh, my name is Colin. I live in Burlington. Um, my biggest concern with this bridge, any bridge redesign is gonna be vehicle speed. Uh, the circulator in Winooski, cars drive really fast. There's a reason it's called the racetrack. They come onto the bridge, they're still going fast. They come up Riverside, they're still going fast. So you can put crosswalks in, but that doesn't mean that it's gonna be safe. Um, and as others have pointed out, it's great to have separated bike pet infrastructure, though I also agree that you should have space for bikes and pedestrians. They're not the same mode and they shouldn't be treated the same. Um, 
So I would like to see more traffic calming on the Burlington side of the bridge in that intersection that I know that's up for redesign. I know the circulator's not in scope, but uh, I hope that someone from Winooski's here and is taking note that the circulator should be up for grabs because that place needs a redesign. Thank you. Excellent. So, so the question was more about traffic coming in the area to get those speeds of, of vehicles down on the bridge, trying to do something in the intersections to accommodate that. Um, certainly changing that intersection, getting it down from the number of signals to one will help improve those conflict points and the crossings. Doesn't directly help with speed, uh, but it is something that we can further look into geometrically to see if there's a way to handle that a little bit. Um, with us being tucked with just a bridge and an intersection, it's hard to control what's happening at that, that rotary, if you will, too. So it is something we can look at and consider as we move forward with the project. Yep, absolutely. I, I believe that might have been a question earlier, too. So the vehicle lanes are getting slightly wider, right? Six inches wider? I mean, you're really six feet, though. I mean, getting six feet to car. That's right. So you say it's six inches, but it's not. The, the striped lanes are getting six inches wider. You're right. There is a little bit of buffer between the cars and the barrier we're putting out there. Which will encourage people to go quick. It, Potentially, but putting up a barrier and driving by one, for, any, for anybody who's driven through like a construction zone and you have the barriers hugged up against you, it naturally feels uncomfortable and you tend to go a little bit slower. That is a type of calming feature and we can look at other ones as well to try to reduce speed as well. You did the opposite. You had a two feet of shoulder on each side plus six inches. You didn't make it tighter, you made it wider. Correct, I never said we made it tighter. Yep. Any questions, Cole? Okay. You, anybody here? There you go. Hi, um, I'm Sarah and I live in Winooski, right by Waterworks and the Cascades and take the bus and bike over the bridge a lot. Um, I'm curious and I think you spoke briefly about it of what the process will be like early on in construction for the temporary walking path in cyclists. Um, so I'm curious about how much you have thought, you know, what, what has gone into that so far as far as planning. Um, how long will it actually not be usable at all for pedestrians and cyclists? Um, I know that that's probably going to be a rough guess. So, and then my third question is, you said there's going to be multiple meetings on different topics, and I really think that that topic should be one of those meetings on the temporary use. Thanks. Yep, so, so if I understood, it's kind of a three-part question about the timing of this little section being built, how long it'll be in use, and then if there's any pedestrian outages associated with it, okay. So that little piece is probably gonna be one of the first things built on the project. We need to both get people over there as well as all the utilities on the bridge, and there's quite a few of them. We need to get the utilities and the people essentially out of the way for the contractor to come through and build the rest of the project. So it will be very early on, and that will become part of the permanent bridge when it's all said and done. So for all intents and purposes, it will look and feel like the permanent bridge. Uh, as far as pedestrian outages, really for the duration of construction, we're looking at maintaining pedestrians across that piece for the duration. There will be a very specific time point in there when the two pieces of the bridge come together that it's physically not safe for people to be out there and there will be construction workers running around trying to get the bridge complete. Don't have a time frame on what that looks like, but we're not talking long term, we're talking maybe a half day. And we're talking maybe overnight work for that. Haven't, fin haven't figured that out uh, entirely, but it will not be a long term impact for that part. I think I got all your questions. Okay. Oh, yes, a meeting just, yes, yeah, so, I, good point. Uh, so I mentioned we will be back for additional public meetings with additional details. I'm hearing a lot about pedestrian safety. It sounds like that's probably something we're gonna come back and talk a lot more about. Um, whether it's specific to that little piece of the bridge and how it gets constructed, maybe we can throw that in there as well. Yep, 
Yes, there will be small shoulders. They're going to be about two feet wide is what we currently have planned. Okay, I think we just have a couple more questions in the back and then I'm going to start in the front again. Anyone over here? Anyone standing up? Question? Okay. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Eli. I live in Winooski. Um, I guess my question is about necessity for four lanes. Uh, why is that still a necessity, like requirement, and where does that stem from? So the question was about the requirement for four lanes and where it stems from. Uh, really with this project, we're replicating the existing conditions. We're going back and providing the same accommodations and trying to provide better access for bikes and peds. In doing so, as we've mentioned, maybe those four lanes aren't necessary in the future, or could be repurposed. That's great. In the same way that a trolley system was taken off the bridge to open it up for different modes of transportation as well. So we're providing the bridge width out there. We're going to open it back up to four lanes day one. Maybe that looks different 25 years in the future. Okay. Thank you so much for being patient. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I was involved early on with the design, so I bear some of the responsibility for what I'm hearing, but that was a while ago, and I think there have been some changes. What I wanted to share is, my name is Sharon Busher, and I live in Burlington, and I was on the city council, and um, was involved in, in the original design and selecting this design, et cetera. Um, I want to make sure that people know that one of the things that was paramount was pedestrian and bicycle safety because that was void. It didn't exist. And, and so I'm listening tonight knowing that we didn't really do a good job in that design. And there was a discussion about having a separate bridge for pedestrians and bicyclists. And I believe, as I recall, and I don't have perfect recall, that it, was, it just was too much money to do both. However, I, things have changed somewhat, and there's more of a dedication to bike lanes, and I think that I was happy to hear you say that there will be more time spent on listening to what comments were made and trying to address the bicycle and pedestrian safety factors that still exist even with the new design. Um, so I, I just wanted, I'm glad that you're going to try to figure out solutions to this because I walk, I don't bike, um, I never had good balance, so even when I was young, so I don't bike, but, but I respect everybody who does bike and I think, you know, the direction we hope to go in is walking, biking, and public transportation, and some cars. I have a car, I'll admit it, and I use it um, to get from here to there. But I walk also. And I feel at risk when I'm right close to speeding cars. It was scary when we did Riverside Avenue. You need to give some distance from the cars and the people. I um, mean, you need to separate bikes from people. Also, pedestrians and bicyclists are they're two different beasts. So anyways, I wanted to say that. The second thing I wanted to say was someone mentioned about the impact of the flood and water. And you mentioned that this bridge is higher. But I'm concerned about the amount of water and the strength of water. And so I I'm not an engineer, I don't know, but I think that I'd like to be reassured that the structure itself can withstand the future because I don't think what people I don't think people know what a 100-year storm is anymore. I think what we're experiencing is, you know, a 100-year storm is now a 10-year or 5-year storm. So I I really feel like that is something that I would like to be reassured and see some information about. And then the last thing is something that is only for a certain population. There is the Mill Street 
uh, population. It's a wonderful little microcosm with small businesses and residents. And they're, they're kind of trapped in all of this. And I want to make sure that we address them so that we don't stifle small businesses. I value them a lot. And we don't make it impossible for the people that live and work there to get in and out of their place um, of, of either residence or business. So those are my comments. Um, and thank you so much for tonight. I feel really reassured that you're really reaching out to the public. Thanks. Thank you for your patience. Any comments from you? Any comments? Yeah. OK. Did you want to address that? And then we'll start in the front, particularly the water flood. Yep. Yeah. Yep, so I, I, I can just weigh in. Thank you for the comments. Um, yes, the bike and pedestrian safety, as we've, we've heard from many people, very big interest out there. We are going to be looking at safety improvements more so than what we flashed here on screen today. So that will be something. The hydraulics, yes, we, we go through a robust hydraulic analysis to understand what types of water movements are coming through there. We look at different flood events. We know resiliency is a big topic right now and trying to plan for the future and more water coming. That's not lost on us. It will all be engineered, analyzed, and robust enough for this bridge to last from any hydraulic flood that we're looking at. Um, I lost the last piece there. Mill Street, thank you. Um, yes, Mill Street residents, yes, we, we understand they are kind of locked in the middle of this overall project. We will absolutely maintain access to their properties throughout construction. What that entirely looks like, we don't have quite yet envisioned, but we understand the implications to those, those parcels in particular, uh, as well as all the other local businesses when we start talking about closures to, to traffic as well. We're starting over. <laughs> oh, did you have another question? Did I miss you? I'm sorry. I went, that's why I was wondering. I thought I saw another hand. No, I apologize. Yeah, well, I guess. I guess I have some questions, more just comments. My name is Ryan, and I think uh, a lot of my comments will just like resonate with what has already been said. But I think, I think it, the the necessity for four lanes, I think, could be disputed. I think it could be less than that, or even like uh, mixed, like mixed lanes, like bus lanes and emergency lanes could have like their own lane but maybe reducing or changing types of traffic because I think the Winooski circle, Burlington coming down into it and this bridge being the choking point, I think it's really important in your 100 year plan to have it be as beneficial for those areas as possible and not just beating what isn't benefiting those areas right now. I think if you can make the circle a wonderful place to be, and it totally could be, it could be such an absolute gem. I already think it is. It's wonderful. I love it. Um, if you could just give it water to feed it, make some more easier ways to walk, easier ways to cycle, easier ways for other types of transportation, because there's more than just that. Uh, I think it's really, really important. And I think the most important thing is people live here. It's a very dense place. And I think making it good for the people who participate in it e economically, and just going to the shops, going to all different restaurants and stuff like that, and for the people that live there, I think that is what is paramount. Make it a nice place to be. I think it could definitely be that, and I don't want this opportunity to be missed. I think it's important. So I was wondering if there's any sort of like traffic calming, if there's any sort of like pedestrian or cycling, um, like, raised sidewalks and stuff like that. Uh, just stuff like that where it would be not so car first, because it definitely is car first, and that to me is just a big problem. Economically, uh, being there, just how the environment is. Yeah, I think that's all I have. Thank you. Great. Thank, thanks for the comments talking about the four lanes and the pedestrians and everything. Sounds like a lot of the same comments we're hearing from the rest of the audience, so it's certainly something we're going to go back and take a harder look at to see what we can do.
Appreciate that. Yep, so the current speed limit out there is 25 miles an hour and will be the same after construction is complete. We don't intend to change that. Um, we can look into calming traffic, uh, traffic calming measures as we've talked about here tonight. Uh, I don't anticipate anything will be put in place until this new bridge is also in place, however. Okay, so we'll start from the beginning. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I think I was un, uh, a little harsh on the gentleman earlier, but I think he brings up a really excellent point. Um, it would be good before the next meeting if um, the people on your team actually navigated the intersections leading into and out of the bridge in all the different ways that everybody here in this room navigates those intersections. That's biking and that's walking. Um, those intersections are extremely treacherous and it'll open your mind if you're not a daily user. Um, and I mean, yeah, no, seriously, I, I will go with you guys as well, absolutely. And you gotta go in rush hour because it is, it's, it's scary. Um, and I think that will be extremely helpful in informing your decision making and setting the guidelines for the contractors. Um, and, and coming up with better ideas. And then just to tack on to what other people have said, um, a, a, a dedicated bus lane, I believe is gonna be extremely important and that should be set out from the very beginning. That's not something that we should um, worry about implementing later. It should be from the inception because uh, this is the most used uh, uh, bus line and maybe the gentleman from GMT can Correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the bus line coming from Winooski is the most used bus line in the entire state. Um, so we have the most to gain from expediting its service across the bridge into and out of Winooski, into and out of Burlington. Thank you. Yeah. Nope, I appreciate that. I appreciate the offer to bike and walk the areas with us too. So we'll, we'll look into probably taking you up on that. Um, as it relates to the bus lane, we do need to coordinate further with GMT to understand. Uh, we want to make sure there's a benefit there. You know, are there current delays in the buses getting across the bridge, and would that type of lane configuration be a benefit, and if so, to what extent? So it's something we can definitely look into as we begin our coordination here in the near future. Yep, so we haven't started looking into different transit line options. It's something we are gonna start coordinating with in with GMT here in the future, but we have not started going down that coordination process. So just a quick show of hands, how many more questions do we have? Okay. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Connor, I'm a resident of Winooski. Um, Two things, one, I do have a bone to pick uh, with the fact that it's called the burlington Winooski Bridge Project <laughs> instead of the Winooski Bridge, uh, Burlington Bridge Project, but <laughs> I digress. Um, I guess, like, I know this is a very early stage, but I'm, I guess, like, to, like, bring us back to, like, the 30,000 foot, um, I'm genuinely curious what are the, maybe, like, top three concerns that AOT has for this project's, you know, conception and construction. Yeah. Don't move. <laughs> yep. Great. So, so the question was more about what are the three biggest risks that we have as kind of a, a design team going forward. Hadn't really thought about the three biggest ones. Um, obviously, us working through the schedule and getting our permits and right away in place to actually deliver this project in the first place is a huge challenge. There's a lot of things to consider here, a lot of competing constraints, a lot of different voices but we still have an obligation to make sure we hit specific time frames before we lose money and then the project gets delayed, I don't know how long. So making sure we work through this type of process, hear the needs, be able to come back and forth and actually iterate on that 
still hit our permitting requirements and still hitting our right-of-way requirements, to me, is probably the biggest risk. Um, there's always risk during construction about things you don't know. That's always just something that's out there. And then finally, at the end of the day, it's really putting back a bridge that doesn't necessarily meet your needs, right? I mean, that's why we're here tonight. We want to come to you and get your input. We want to hear about what we need to change. And if we get it wrong, that's a risk. So. Anyone else in this row? Yes. Uh, so I think you'll agree that about 80% of the comments tonight have to do with safety, noise, and multimodal transportation. Uh, given that, I'm wondering how you or the plan dictates uh, dedicating six additional feet to motorists. You'll notice that not a single person here tonight has said they needed to cross the bridge in their car a half a second faster. Yep, good question. So the question was about essentially adding six inches to the lanes plus the two foot shoulder on the outside. Really those numbers just meet current standards for the lane configuration out there. It's something we can go back and take another look at, but those are the current state standards that we use across the board everywhere. Um, I agree, I have heard 80% of the comments tonight have been about bikes and pedestrian safety. Um, I'm not sure if anybody has any comments about cars. Oh, maybe one. We'll get to that next. So. They go too fast. Anybody? Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Jack. I former uh, resident of Winooski, current resident of Burlington. Um, I, I kind of wanted to just like synthesize some of the things that I've been hearing from people tonight. I agree with a lot of it, um, but it seems like there's a lot of frustration around looking at a project that's going to take seven years and cost sixty million dollars. And I understand from an engineering perspective that like lane configuration is not the same as building a bridge, but I think for you know, emotional investment for people who live here and use this bridge every day, that hearing that kind of time scale and that kind of cost and like, but we're just gonna recreate as close to the existing conditions, especially for cars, right? That's not gonna change. And that's why you're probably not hearing people coming out to comment on that is because it effectively won't really change uh, what's happening for them. But for people who use the bridge in other ways, um, there's a really, big change here there's a it's a very acute pain point um so anyway i just wanted to kind of call that out and say that like i know like I, I can rationally understand why that like you can separate what uh what happens from an engineering perspective and like lane configurations but i think from a public perspective you know we're looking at a, a project this size feeling like that's kind of crazy that we're going to wait seven years and have something that feels kind of what, like what we already have um and then from a second just kind of addition um thinking about especially downtown Winooski, um, where it's kind of basically a highway. Um, it has this like seed of being a place that's really nice to be in at certain times when the planes are not flying and there's a gap in traffic. It is a really nice place to be. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't imp impact Burlington as much. Um, it does, you know, in, in little ways further down downstream, but it's, it's such a big impact as someone like, who used to live in downtown Winooski there. Um, just there's there's a big emotional attachment to the amount of traffic flowing through this circle and looking for changes and not waiting seven years to then start those conversations. So, thank you. Uh, appreciate the comments, Prince. You kind of summarizing all that. Um, yeah, the feeling in the room that from what I'm gathering is cars are going too fast, too many of them, lack of safety with pedestrians walking next to them, kind of that impact on the downtown setting and what it feels like. So. I appreciate that. No, I think she. Put um, oh. Yep. So the speed limit is 25 miles an hour out there and won't change. Um, that's our plan at the moment. Okay. Next row. Thank you for your patience. So I have a, a couple quick uh, uh, follow-up questions. One is, um, uh, I think you're hearing from a lot of people in this room, we're wanting you to be more visionary, to, to look at more multimodal stuff. Uh, when you talk with GMT, I, don't, I hope you don't just talk about delays, but you talk about ways of expediting and making, um, making public transport faster uh, and more desirable so more people will use it. Um, I think the question on the line was about traffic 
real speeds. We know the speed limit is 25. We know people aren't doing that. They're doing more. I do more if I can. Um, and I'm going to be able to go much faster with, with the additional lane width. So I'm really concerned about that additional uh, width of uh, vehicle uh, travel space. That, that's going to exacerbate the conflicts between users that we're, everybody in this room is already concerned about. So we'd love to, for you to come back to us with existing data on current actual traffic speeds, not the speed limit, and uh, look to are those um, the lane widths and the shoulders really necessary? Are they, are they standard for vehicle-centric uh, design, or is it something that could be adapted? I am. Thank you. Um, so, so I, again, more more comments. So, so the operational speed limit, I don't know. Um, we we don't enforce the speed out there. We provide the infrastructure, and it's up to law enforcement to understand that part. We can certainly uh, try to coordinate what that might look like, so we can try to find that out. It's really important. Understood. Understood. Um, yes, we're looking at traffic calming. I know that was a lot of. The input tonight was about traffic calming measures. How can we make sure people slow down? Does this increase width do anything? Um, part of the other reason for the two-foot shoulder that I haven't mentioned was right now there's no, there's no barrier out there, right? You've got that raised sidewalk, feels really uncomfortable. Somebody's mirror on a car could probably hit you. That two-foot shoulder is out there is a small buffer from the lane to the barrier, so that way they're not scraping the barrier as they're driving. So I can't say we can just go back and get rid of a two-foot lane and call it good, or two-foot shoulder. We'd have to actually go back and look at that to see if we can still physically fit cars through there. Maybe you could put the two-foot shoulder on the pedestrian bike side instead of on the driving side. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Understood. And that would keep the separation, the like physical separation, not just the barrier, but the physical separation between pedestrians and bikers. Yep. We can look at those types of configurations. Yep. Thank you. So that's not one that I can personally comment on. Um, we talked a lot about putting four lanes back, replicating existing conditions. I'm not sure of Winooski's specific vision at this point. So it's something we'd have to look more into. Hi, I'm Susan, and I just had this thought. Why don't we have, on the way into Burlington in the morning, have it, we'll have three lanes. Have one lane going, least traffic, and yeah, use three lanes, and at different times of day, we have to change which lanes go which way. That seems like a possibility. It's done all the time. That's the type of innovation we want. Yeah. Yes. Yep, so, so having alternating lanes, so essentially having a three-lane configuration with two going one direction sometimes of the day and two going the other. Understood. So that type of thing has been used in different cities where there's a lot, a lot, a lot of physical constraints that they can't overbuild and provide the accommodation full time. It can be confusing to drivers to understand as they're coming through what's actually available for them. Right? There's different features, whether it's with different light styles and kind of you know green circles and red X's to let people know. There's other ones with a physical barrier down the middle that can get relocated. This project is way too short for a physical barrier relocation to happen over and over again, and it's incredibly expensive. Um, we can definitely look more into different intelligent transportation systems, or ITS, to help out with that type of configuration. It'd be something we can go back and talk about. Uh, un understood. Yep. Yep. Thank you. He's just gonna grab a water. Oh, good. <laughs> no water. No water I'm giving you. I'm giving you a moment of peace. Okay. <laughs> My name's Angie, and I just want to commend you for keeping your equanimity with this barrage of questions, in great variety of questions, keeping your imminent, um, equanimity and sense of humor 
and taking it all in. I'm confident that you're taking it all in because that's what you asked us to do. So thank you. That's all. Thank you. Anyone else? No? No, sir? Hey, I'm, I'm Ryan. I live in Winooski. Uh, I also wanted to start with saying thank you for standing up there for two hours and listening to us. Um, it's a very friendly crowd, and I want to pile on really quickly. Um, it's an incredibly harrowing experience to bike across that bridge, as me and my wife do way more often than we drive it. Um, I'm relieved to hear about uh, maintaining pedestrian access across the bridge. That was a big concern of ours as people who bike into Burlington for work um, during the construction phase. Uh, but I would implore you guys to do better than go from near-death experience to feeling like we're not going to die going across the bridge in the end of this. And you really de-emphasize the automobile um, because it's literally killing people. Um, and, and be more creative and think of better ways to, to use this bridge and to cut down on traffic. Because, yeah, downtown Winooski could be a way better place. Um, the F-35 is another conversation. But um, just not having that flow of traffic through the city and over the bridge, it could be a heck of a better community. So thanks. Thank you. Is there a comment? Cole? I figured you wanted to use that. Is this a comment or do you want to address that? Yeah, you don't Yeah, just want to move on, try to get everybody out of here. My name is Solvay, and I know you answered the question from someone else about the roundabout um, as an option for the intersection. I'm, I'm very familiar over the years of the discussions that have happened. Uh, I was on the Public Works Commission in Burlington for many years. Um, and I'm flummoxed at why there is such resistance to using a roundabout, which even in the most recent uh, letter from the City Council to I guess retrans saying that they want the uh, signalized intersection, even though their own letter says that the uh, the best option, the roundabout, is best for improving pedestrian safety. It's best for reducing potential for crashes, and it's best for managing peak hour congestion. My question is: um, I've been told at different points that it's the federal government funding that will prevent us from using a roundabout there because the financing, it's too complicated and they don't want to do that, or it's a V-trans thing. So my question is, I'm familiar with other communities that are going gangbuster with putting in roundabouts for safety, 24-7 traffic calming. It will deal with the issue of people seeing a yellow light and stepping on it at the stoplights, which is going to happen. So I'm, I'm just, my question is, is it really true that the federal government's financing, like that grant money, or something in the VTRN's policies, prevents the city from considering a roundabout for that intersection? Hmm? Oh. I get the pleasure of this one. Uh, again, Laura from Burlington Public Works. Um, it is somewhat tied to the federal funding. The roundabout option takes out more historical properties. And under the uh, NEPA review or federal environmental permitting review, they will just fundamentally not let us select that option for funding because of its impacts. Um, we can still continue to just verify that as we do a much deeper dive into the environmental impacts under this project than would have been done in the scoping studies. Um, but that is really the fundamental which had to lead the selection committee under the scoping studies and ultimately the Burlington City Council to selecting the signalized intersection alternative. Do you need to repeat that? I don't know if they heard me. You had another question? My concern is that you have documentation that says that the alternative that's safest is you know, in the public record, and as soon as those accidents and people being killed, and there have been people, pedestrians killed at that intersection, 
once that starts happening, and the cost is being transitioned to the, po the population that is injured in a crash or is r run over by a car, and the fact that this is in the public record is going to be a, a potential liability risk for the communities that have voted to not use the most safe choice for the intersection. So that's part of the reason I'm asking. You know, that's an issue that I think should be considered, um, and that it's not is a risk, a liability risk, that the, uh, the legal departments of the cities probably should think about. Well, I definitely appreciate the comments. As Laura mentioned, it's something we can go back and revisit a little bit and see if there's any, any wiggle room. Um, but I definitely understand the comments and the concerns that we'll take back. So we are just past eight. I just want to, we're not gonna stop, but anybody who wants to get up because they need to get home, please feel free. There, we, this is a judgment-free zone at all, um, always. So we, just, we, we will definitely stay and answer more questions. Um, so let's go, we got this, we are here. <laughs> My question. I think I heard you say you're going to build a temporary pedestrian bridge across the river. Is that correct? And if it's going to be temporary, why cannot it be permanent? Why can't it be permanent? That's point one. That's a real question. The other thing is that I think detouring all this traffic will be a wonderful opportunity for Winooski and Burling to work together to reduce the traffic that comes through the old East End, which is where I live. You know, that traffic, we have monitored it, and we know that that traffic does not adhere to the, to the uh, speed limits. We have that information. So if the cities could work together to make that a nice, another way to get to town other than through the old East End, that would be great. But I want to know about the permanent and temporary drip bridge. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the, the, the real question was about the temporary versus pedestrian, uh, permanent pedestrian bridge. Um, and maybe I misspoke earlier, but in this kind of situation where we build a pedestrian bridge off to the side, that will become part of the permanent infrastructure. It will be permanent. It's built off to the side as an initial phase in order to keep traf uh, pedestrian traffic moving through the project site while we build the rest of the project but it will be part of the overall project. So we'll build a little piece off to the side for pedestrians, we'll build a much bigger piece upstream that's going to be part of the structure, and then during a four to six week closure, we're going to demolish the bridge and push that big piece over to touch into that initial piece. So they have to be joined? They will be joined, yep. Yep. Yep, and that is something we've considered as well. It ends up being different funding sources, different projects, different maintenance needs. So there's a lot of additional hurdles to overcome with that. Making it a single combined bridge gets rid of a lot of those obstacles. Any other questions here? Here you go. Thank you for your patience. Uh, sure. Hi, I'm the person who raised my hand and said that I was scared to drive in the area. I'm a recent arrival, and um, it, the, the speed that in that oval is insane. I've never, I have never been in a roundabout before where you had to indicate with your blinker that you were staying in the roundabout. <laughs> that was a, an eye-opener for me. And that coming, you know, all that traffic is just whizzing right onto that bridge. And I think that um, enforcement needs to be involved. So that's why I'm afraid as a car driver, as well as a walker and a biker. Thank you. You're welcome. Any problem? Keep going? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else here? Yes. There you go. Can we go back to the financial slide, please? I'm curious about some of these numbers. You've got 24.8 million listed here. Is there other federal funds in addition to the raise grant? Yes. Okay. Sure. And when we say the intersection, that's the Burlington side? Correct. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I'd also just bring up a slight point, right? We're obviously in a time of inflation at the Fed's target, which is 2%. Uh, 
50 million, which is the low end, turns into 60 million over your project duration. That's not to say anything about the inflation that we've seen recently or potentially higher. That still could come. Right? So this project could end up at 80 million, 100 million, and then you could still have 100 or 80 people that are really pissed off that they didn't get what they wanted. Separate no, bridge. let's work together. I, I'm not necessarily convinced that separate bridge is it, but separate in that bikers and, and vehicles are separate, and ideally even pedestrians and bikers could be separate. Um, I'm not attached to it being a separate bridge altogether. It could be separate but divided. You know, I think all of us are willing to compromise. Um, I, I'm hearing at times, I think, loose promises and loose guarantees. This room made itself clear and will continue to do so. We would like you to receive that input. We really genuinely want the best for ourselves, for our children, you know, for our community. Thank you. Do you need to address that? Yes. Okay. And you have Hi, I'm John. Uh, I recently moved to Winooski, um, and I had some basically to piggyback on the biking and walking, um, and also give a suggestion to it. So first thing is it's basically you have 12 feet on the, either side. They're both equal. They're both mixed use. Um, has there been any thought to making the east and west different? So as a biker who's gone across there, um, I normally am on the west side of the bridge and that's kind of Riverside comes into there. So is there any thought to maybe reduce it on the east side to eight feet and give back four feet to the west side? And you could have a dedicated bike path there. Pedestrian access could be slightly raised six inches or something. You still have probably two, three feet. You could put plantings or something like that. Um, just thinking about them maybe differently from my experience to going across the bridge, so. No, definitely appreciate the comments. It is something we've talked about loosely so far. Um, we didn't want to make any decisions before coming to hear everybody. Uh, but we have talked a little bit about having separate pedestrians one side, bikes on the other. No conclusion. Uh, there's no easy answer, right? Bikers come from Riverside. They also come down Colchester. So if you put it all on one side, then the bikers have to zigzag through an intersection to get over there. And if they're going east in Mooski, they got to do it the same way. So it kind of funnels right back to that same concept of we know we've got infrastructure on the bridge, we know we have bike lanes in both approaches, we need to find a safe way to make that connection happen. Okay. Anybody? Okay, last, is this the last question? Is it? Could be. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> You're the grand prize winner. Yeah, what do I get? <laughs> uh, a hug, I'll give you a hug. Okay, uh, when I see you again, after when we're not so sweaty, I'll give you a hug. <laughs> okay. Um, this one uh, is in regard to the financing. I, I just remembered seeing these emails, uh, announcements coming up from the, um, from the Federal Transportation Department about the Reconnecting Communities uh, program. There's this series of grants going out to help fund um, the, the to, to reverse the harm that you know, like our infrastructure is our car infrastructure is done in the U.S. They have all this like money available to help. I don't know, improve things in other ways. Um, um, it, it, would that be something we could look into um, for this project? And then I have uh, one. Small question, can we get trees on the bridge? Trees, 
so so the, the, the two questions for the people on, on line two, one was about trying to get an additional grant to help offset some of these costs. Uh, I'm unsure if that's feasible personally, but it's something we can look into uh, to see if we can get a little bit more money. The other was about plantings on the bridge. I don't think we're gonna go forward with trees that they take up a lot of space. There's a lot of weight, a lot of issues with them. As Carolyn mentioned, planters can definitely be something that can be considered. Um, just nothing is so enormous, so. Excellent. Appreciate everybody's time tonight. Uh, we'll, we definitely heard all the comments. Thank you.